Hi, everybody. We're here to talk about virtual reality. And I was just saying to our excellent panelists here before this began that I, this may be the 12th annual Games for Change Festival, but I wouldn't be surprised if a few years from now we're calling it the Virtual Reality for Change Festival because there's so much excitement about virtual reality, so many people thinking that virtual reality is the new big thing that we're going to experience so much of the world in, not just through video games, but through lots of other experiences. So just for starters, before I introduce our panelists, I'd like you guys to tell us a little more about yourselves. Show of hands if you've heard of virtual reality. Good, you're in the right place. Keep those hands up if you have used virtual reality before. And of those who have their hands up, keep them, well, keep, keep them up, keep them up. Keep them up if you liked it enough that you would try it again. Okay, so most people seem to be satisfied customers of virtual reality, which is great. Um, to my left, we have Jackie Morey. She is a chief scientist at All These Worlds, a company that she founded, and she's done a lot of great work in virtual reality and virtual worlds. And to my right, Michael Abrash, chief scientist, two chief scientists here, <laughs> we're lucky enough. Uh, and he is chief scientist at, o at Oculus, a company you may have heard of as the probably the foremost company bringing virtual reality into the mainstream with their signature Oculus goggles. Um, both of you, I'd love for you to just tell the audience a bit about the work you've done in virtual reality and some of your experiences in VR. Okay, um, I did bring a few slides, if I could have my first slide. And the reason I brought some slides is because it, the virtual reality I started with was a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, and a lot of you were probably not even born then. So I thought it'd be good to just give you a sampling of some of the work that I've done over the years. And for me, virtual reality has always been about creating meaning and evoking emotions from people. And having people get into virtual reality and have an indelible experience, something they would never forget. So my first VR experience was 1989. Uh, you can see the head-mounted display that I had on. It was quite large. It had a breastplate uh, that counterweighted it so it wouldn't fall off your head. Um, and I was seeing something like this image here. I don't even remember what my first experience was, but there were a lot of buzzwords going around about virtual reality, how it was so trippy or seductive and it would amplify your mind. And I didn't see that in any of the experiences I was having. And what I wanted out of my virtual reality experience was meaning and emotion. So I was lucky enough to get a job at a place that was really starting on virtual reality in the early days. Uh, we were doing things that uh, did things like tested your vision in a head-mounted display, and we found out that almost everybody was legally blind in them. Um, but we decided to use some of the equipment that the Army was doing to make those tests and make experiences that evoked emotional responses. So I did this from 1991 to 1994 with my partner, Mike Goslin, who worked with Jesse Schell uh, at Disney Imagineering doing a lot of their virtual reality later um, in the 90s. So what we did was create a series of experiences, each one designed to evoke a different emotional response. Now, they're very um, low res for what we're, what we're used to experiencing today, but we used a lot of techniques to bring these emotions out in people. Uh, for example, uh, I don't know how well you can see these, but the one with the blue background, that was called Fang City. And that started out as an idyllic landscape, but turned into this cacophony of ticking clocks and buildings ripping through the landscape. Um, so I won't go into all of them, but there were a number of, of different experiences. The one up in the corner was a conversation room where you were hearing a conversation like you were at a party, but there was nobody there. And there was a photo album, and if you went to the photo album and turned the pages, each, each photograph had a snippet of conversation that would kind of disassociate itself from the walla walla of the crowd, and you would hear that. And we showed this at the Florida Film Festival. So this was the first VR at any film festival, uh, Vertopia at the Florida Film Festival in Orlando, Florida, in 1992 and 93. And we got great reactions from the audience. The one that people liked or hated the most was the 30-foot high spider that we put you in. So you were in a blood red space, a sphere, and the spider would come at you, but he might come at you and he might ignore you. He had eight different states. And so depending on how you moved, he might come after you or not. But what we did was we put a heartbeat in our fully spatialized sound that we were using. And we had eight different heartbeats that associated with the spider state. 
and your heartbeat tended to entrain with those. And so people got very, very agitated in, in this world. And uh, some people ripped the head mount off and ran from the room. So that's all to say that I think virtual reality really needs quality experiences and experiences that give us the true interaction that VR is capable of. Uh, we are immersed totally in these things with our body. That means we can use as many senses as possible. We can use olfactory sense, true 3D sound, great visuals. We can use a lot of things that engage our kinesthetic sensibilities. And these can be story or non-narrative experiences, but if they create these emotional connections and they instill memories in the people who experience them, I think then they're successful. So I was lucky enough to work at the Institute for Creative Technologies and had the Army uh, fund a test bed for virtual reality research so I could bring more of these emotional cues into virtual reality. So we were able to do a lot of things with this. We made a scenario called DarkCon, which was ostensibly a, a forward observer mission in Bosnia. And we used a lot of different techniques to really get emotional responses where we designed them in the experience. And I don't have time to go into all of them, but we had spatialized sound, smells, and uh, an emotional score. And I'll talk a little bit more about that because this is the setup we had this was the VR theater at ICT. It had a 10.2 sound system that we were able to make uh, real-time spatialized. So the, uh, they were triggered from the um, six degrees of freedom information from the VR wherever the person was. Um, and while we had the theater, most people saw the visuals on the 120 degree screen, but the participant was in a head mounted display. So they were very isolated from the physical world they were totally immersed in the virtual. The floor, we put 10 subsonic transducers in um, that we played from four to 20 hertz. So they were below the level of hearing, but we were able to score them like an emotional score and have people actually get this visceral reaction where we wanted them to be more agitated. Where we wanted them to be calm, they were, we didn't play the sounds. Um, and then the scent collar was a way to get smells into a room-sized space that didn't stink up the room forever afterwards. And so we came up with this idea for a scent collar that would was Bluetooth triggered, so it was wireless, it, and the smell would be sort of wafted up by your nose. It was more of a molecular drift thing. Nothing was squirted into your face. And we had some pretty amazing smells like bat guano um, in this cave that we had people go through. So. Those are just some of the things that you can do. Um, beyond the work for the military, I also did some artistic virtual realities, and I'm just gonna mention one of these called The Memory Stairs, which was a fairly autobiographical piece that was chronological experiences from before birth to near death, and this was a fully immersive um, experience with a, a, a one-of-a-kind head-mounted display uh, prototype that had a 120-degree field of view, so it was pretty nice. Um, but you can see uh, the one picture was before birth, so all of the images were very fuzzy. Uh, there were things like a fight that the, the baby might hear or a, a lullaby. Uh, the sounds all came through like a watery filter. Um, and then the next one was you were just new, you were in the crib, um, you were, your, your eyes closed a lot, but when they were open, faces would drift in and goo at you and coo and make little noises and you would smell baby powder and, and your mother's perfume. Um, the next, uh, one of the other memories was called the Forgotten Rooms and I'm not gonna play the sound for this, but this was two rooms that were supposed to be really old and ancient and you walked around them but you couldn't get out. There were no doors to get out. So all you could do was really explore this space. There was a sound of a clock ticking very, very slowly, which made everything seem like it was in, an, in another dimension. Um, and as you walked around this space, uh, you could smell the fireplace, you could smell uh, some tobacco smells. And if, if you stayed there long enough, you could see ghosts from the past who would appear. Um, and the two ghosts in this were children, and they were my brother and my sister. Uh, so this was, this was a pretty interesting thing. The TV had a, a video that uh, we made, a custom video with some really interesting music behind it. And it was just a very haunting and nostalgic place to be. So let's 
Let's see if I can go to the next one. So just a couple of closing thoughts on, on my designing um, DRs, how I go about it. I want to make a work that's unique for each person. And what I really think is special about VR is that you create a space that the participant comes and finishes. That experience is unique to each person. It's not something that you, you make and they just kind of sit there and watch it. They make choices, they have agency, and it can change them. So inhabiting this space viscerally is really powerful. We are in a space that is every bit as powerful as the physical world we live in. But we're not in a physical world. We're in a phenomenological space that allows us to do all kinds of things for people that we might not be able to do. And it's kind of a hallowed space, if you will, that we can make all kinds of interesting experiences for people. Well, thanks, Jackie. Michael, could you share a little bit about your experience with VR, but also what's so special about VR to you? Why is it different than just looking at something through a TV or a monitor? Great question, and it comes right off the end of what Jackie said. So the thing about VR is that it is about having experiences. It's not about looking at pictures or videos of experience. It's not about hearing about them. It's not having this derived experience. It's actually having an experience. And I would imagine that most of you who've had a VR demo, at least a good VR demo, have come away with that funny sense of, in a way, you think you actually did that thing. And then, in a way, you know you didn't. And, but it, it still has that sense of, as Jackie said, it's real to you. It's not real reality. It's virtual reality, but it's reality nonetheless. And Jackie works on experiences. I work on creating the infrastructure that allows people like Jackie to create those experiences. The key to that is the VR drives your perceptual system directly to create those experiences. And I gave a talk at F8 a few weeks ago that you can find online that goes into this much more detail. But I just want to show you a couple of examples of how you really do, you construct re your own personal reality. and. I, it, the, the key is that when you have this experience, it's your experience. So I see it started already. So anybody who hasn't seen this before, something weird is going on here. I think we can agree on that. Okay, so you can think for a second about what's going on if you don't already know. Now let's go to the next one. So it was concave. In the real world, most objects, and certainly faces, are, in fact, convex, right? And you're, you make that assumption. When you look at the world, you're not trying to reconstruct it from scratch and say, huh, I wonder what I'm looking at. You're saying, I probably know what I'm looking at. What's the most likely thing out of what all my years of experience and my genes tell me is likely? So here's the thing about that, is that most of that is far, far below your conscious level. And it's something that just gets done for you to construct reality, whether you consciously know it or not. So here's the trick for you. Now that you know what, the, what is going on here, let's see if you can see it as convex now. Go ahead, next slide. So you know consciously exactly what is going on here, and yet your perceptual system is constructing a reality for you that you're experiencing it. And that's what VR is about. So now I want to show you one other example of this, um, which fuses two different senses. Can we go to the next one? Far, 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 far. So obviously she's saying bar. Now let's go to the next one. Far, 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 far. Far. So obviously she's saying far, um, except that she's not saying far. The soundtrack for that was the exact same soundtrack as for the first video. She is in fact saying bar. So we are going, I'm, in a second, they don't, they don't believe you. in a second I'm going to play this video again. So I know that that's the reaction I get. <laughs> I'm going to play this video again, a, or a version of it, but it's going to be a split screen. And as it plays, move your eyes back and forth between the two sides and see what happens to what you're hearing. Can we go to the next one? Far, 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 far. <laughs> so 
I'll tell you the funniest thing is as the second one was playing, the one where her mouth is saying far, but the soundtrack's far, it was playing, and I was thinking, oh, it's playing up here, but oh wait, it's saying far. We must have somehow got this mixed up <laughs> because I was looking at the screen. So even though I've seen this a dozen times, it still worked perfectly for me. So the thing is, when what you experience as reality is actually something that's constructed from your sensors and then from low-level processing. And in this case, there's a visual signal and there's an audio signal. And they conflict in this case, and your brain chooses to use the visual signal. And the reason that it does that is actually very reasonable. Suppose that you're in a crowded restaurant and you're trying to hear what someone's saying. The noise channel can easily be very, very filled with noise. The visual channel is unlikely to be noisy. So if they conflict in a way that can be reconciled as being pretty close, your brain is going to pick the visual one because it's the reliable one. But the key here is that just like with that dragon, you saw a convex dragon face move in odd ways. Here, you heard the sound far instead of bar, even though if you were to do a Fourier analysis in this room, that sound didn't exist. And it's not like you, you thought, oh, that kind of looks like, it sounds like far. It's just you knew you were hearing it. That's reality. Reality is what your senses construct for you. And what virtual reality can do, as Jackie pointed out, is it can construct new experiences by driving your senses in particular ways. And that's what we're learning how to do. Now, I'm curious what both of you think in terms of where are we in terms of the story of virtual reality? Because it's something that everybody, when they were kids, in some sense experienced through science fiction or through uh, just their own imagination. I think of this as maybe we're at the Model T moment of virtual reality. It's finally something that is about ready for regular consumers to have. Certainly Oculus is going to be putting out a headset that anybody can buy and experience virtual reality. Where are we in this path of VR? Jackie, first. I think we're really at a great point because the technology itself, which was locked behind research labs for so long, is out there. It's democratized. I mean, if the, if the Oculus Rift story did one thing, it democratized virtual reality technology so that so many people could use it. And with that many people looking at it, I think we have the potential to come up with some real solutions and some real interesting ways to use virtual reality we haven't thought of yet. So I think you put it very well. I don't know if I'd say Model T moment. What I would say is, for the first time, we're on the road, right? Up to this point, we've been trying to figure out how to construct cars and how to make roads. And I think this is the cusp point. After this, I think it becomes something that millions of people will use that's a consumer device. What, what has kept it from happening until now? What, is, what do you think oh. is holding it back? I, I would say, in short, technology, but I think Jackie could give us a much better answer. Cost. <laughs> I mean, cost. Uh, the, the interesting thing to me is that back in the late 80s, people that put on a head-mounted display and had this sort of eureka moment, like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I really think this is great. Well, that was wonderful, but then there was no way to continue to use it. There was no way to really work on it unless you uh, snuck your way into a research lab, which is what I did. Uh, talked my way into a research lab. But then Mark Zuckerberg had the same experience. Puts on a head mount display, goes, oh, this is amazing. But he had a backpack of money to throw at it. So, you know, all of a sudden it wasn't writing a 400 page proposal to the DOD to work on something in virtual reality. It was, it was out there. It was, the cost was not the big issue and it wasn't locked behind these research labs. A lot of people have thought of VR, though, as a gaming thing, but it, it's about more than video games, right? I mean, it's not even necessarily uh, proven that video games are going to be the thing with VR. I mean, what do you, th what do you guys think VR can be used for and what so it can do? VR is about producing experiences. Certainly games of many types are a big part of that, but there are lots of things that aren't games that matter a lot. I mean, telepresence, being able to be with other people, do things with other people will matter a huge amount. I mean, really, in some sense, as VR gets better and better, what you should think of is that all the experiences that humans can have become possible, right? That, that space of possibilities expands. And so it's not so much saying what does this make possible as what can you imagine creating as an experience in that space. And that's what Jackie's been thinking about for a quarter century now, I think. That makes me sound old. <laughs> um, I think games are one really wonderful way that we can use virtual reality. But as I was saying before, 
what you can do is create the space of possibilities that the person who's experiencing right. this can complete. And most games give us goals, they give us structures, they give us some choices, but not a lot of choices. And imagine if, if the game was that you had to figure out what the game was and you had to create the game while you were playing it. So there are a lot of things that we can do with virtual reality we can't necessarily do with games. Although I do think games are going to be one of the things along the VR continuum that people continue to make. Sure, I, I think I'd throw one more yeah. thing in there, which is that people do fairly often say, well, what's a killer app for VR? And it's a good question. But when you wake up in the morning, do you say, what's a killer app for reality? Should I get out of bed <laughs> or should I just curl up in a ball? And that's a better analogy in the long run. Sounds, sounds good. I don't know, the killer app for reality for me is a bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich in the morning. I cannot it's argue pretty, with that one. Pretty good. You were t saying backstage though that empathy is something that you think can be uh, applied with VR in a way that maybe we don't get from other experiences. Can you talk a little there's, about that? There's been a lot of talk at this conference and at the film festival about um, how you can use games to change someone's viewpoint where you can establish empathy by letting people walk a mile in someone else's shoes or someone else's avatar or whatever that is. And I think that is one of the really great purposes of games, that you get that other viewpoint. I think because of VR being a system that separates you from physical reality, it puts you in another place, sort of phenomenologically, you are in a different space. You may still be sitting in the real world, but you are someplace else. And because of that, I think we can use VR to create a personal empathy. So we're bombarded all the time by media that tells us we're not good enough unless we buy this thing or that thing. But what if we used VR to create that personal empathy so that you would s people can start to feel better and about themselves and know themselves and understand themselves and then not be bothered by the things out in the physical world that tr try to degrade that? You're talking about things like uh, I might have the headset on and suddenly I, I would know what it's like to be as tall as you, all right? Or I would know, I'd look down and I would have a woman's body instead of a man's body. And Jeremy Balenson has done a lot of research on this at Stanford, and it's worth looking at because it really changes people's perception, it changes their performance. It gives you the ability to configure the reality you're experiencing so that you have broader experience and it does shape how you think about things. What's it like when, you're, when, when your piece where you're actually in the crib, like what does that feel like? It, it, it's an interesting thing because we're coming at it with the memories we have from being an adult. So it's, it's different than what a baby might feel, although, right the part of the idea was to give you the sense of being a baby. But you can't move, there's no navigation in that particular experience, so all you can do is look around and, and because you're a baby, you know, your eyes are closing, you know, so things go dark and then you wake up and it's a totally different place. Um, you, so you can do some things, but remember, you have to remember that we're coming at it with all of the experiences that have brought us to the space we are right now in our lives. Um, so you can do certain things, mm -hmm. and you can, you can do it in a way that changes people's perception. Um, that's why I think it, it, it is going to be a good empathy machine, if you will. Do you think it, because you're putting on the headset, though, and you're blocking yourself off, or at least that's how an observer might see it, that it's in some way antisocial and that it cuts you off? I mean, we hear so many good things about VR, but does it potentially limit us from connecting to people in some way? So I think that... VR has the potential to be the most social thing, while at the same time you are putting something over your eyes. Mm -hmm. Because if you can be in a virtual space with other people's avatars, and they feel like people to you, which is something that is not trivial to do, but I believe is doable, then you can connect with anybody. It's sort of like saying, well, the internet is alienating because you sit in front of a computer screen instead of being out in the real world, but at the same time you're in contact with so many people you would never have been in contact before. Right, the network is much bigger. And so it has that potential to really create a lot of shared experience. In the early days, there were shared um, games. So Dactyl Nightmare was one of those games you play with two or three other people. Um, and you were in that space with the other people, even though they weren't around. They might have been in a different room or they might have been in a different city. Um, today we have virtual worlds, which are sort of a harbinger, I think, of how you can do social VR. So in many of these virtual worlds, you can put on a 
headset now and see it in 3D, but you can be in there with people, with people's avatars who are in a different country, and you can get a lot of mileage from being with people in a way that doesn't seem physically real, but it is totally emotionally uh, real for your, for your mind. And then once you throw in the, the bandwidth that VR gives you, where you absorb this information in so many more ways, that a lot of them below the conscious level, and you're really with those people, and you're really having experiences with them. So it's what you describe times 10. Creating memories. Exactly. Well, what do you mean things happening below the conscious level? What's, what's going on there? So one of the experiences that I've had that I think a lot of people have with VR is they, they do a VR demo. They take off the headset and they're disoriented because there's a room around you, right? And they had accepted, not in a conscious way, because you're wearing this thing on your head and you know, it, the resolution is not that good. And there are all these things telling you this is not wherever you're supposed to be. And yet, there's enough information coming in through your senses in ways that fuse, that the combination of the scene staying in the right place and the audio, um, basically that your unconscious processing that processes your video and puts you in a place in the world says, oh, you're just here. And it doesn't matter that consciously you know you're not there. You have absorbed it as if you were. And again, this is what Jackie was talking about. Your brain buys it. Your brain buys it, and because your brain buys it, you're there. Even if you're like metaconscious understands in some way that you're sitting in this room and you're not really in a, you know, a flower filled field smelling the roses, your brain is still buying that. And um, that's all it takes to create something that's meaningful for you. And I mean, I would point out your brain knew that that dragon's face was concave, and your brain knew that the soundtrack was barred. It didn't make any difference. That's not how you process the world. Do you think that uh, eventually people will prefer this? Is some people will prefer the virtual world that they can be in versus the real? Well, I think that depends on the physical reality they're stuck with. <laughs> right. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully nobody's in that kind of thing that where they would have to escape to the virtual world. But I think there'll be room for it as a way that we have experiences that dovetail with our physical uh, existence. Mm. And I, I think in the long run, Mixed reality is what's really interesting. Physical objects that get pulled into virtual worlds, augmented reality where you put virtual objects into the real world, right? There's no reason to draw this sharp distinction between the two. Right, and you talked about that in your F8 talk, that you know, if, if people look down in a virtual reality headset, they're gonna wanna see their own legs, or at least know that Absolutely. if they step forward, that their leg moves forward. I and I guess these are some of the things that VR still needs to achieve, right? That ability to interface, that ability to actually sort of, not just see that world, but, but touch that world, right? I think one of the last challenges is getting those personal avatars into a virtual reality experience. Uh, we never really had them. It was all first person viewpoint through your eyes, but you're right. When you look down, part of you is missing, and that is very disconcerting. And so if we can minimize the disconcerting aspects of VR, the things that pull us out of that immersion, they're called kind of breaks in presence. Mm -hmm. If we can minimize those, then we can give better experiences to people. And you hit on the other important thing. Part of it is you, you have to have self-presence. You need to have telepresence for other people. And really, I take that one step further and say social presence, which is there are ways that people interact, and you have to be able to get those cues to come through so that people really believe the interaction is there. The other thing is you need to have the interaction there. Right? There are two feedback loops. One is you move your head, and the visuals stay right, and the sound stays right. The other one is you interact with the world. These are dexterous manipulators. And a long way from where we are today to actually being able to interact with the world the way that we do with the real world. And I think that's key. Excellent. I think there's a lot of exciting potential for all of this. And we agree it certainly can be a force for change and a force for good, right? Virtual Absolutely. reality. Oh, huge. I want to thank Jackie and Michael for taking some time to talk VR with us. Let's give them a hand. Okay.